Okay, so let, let's begin, inshallah. Okay, so we're going to, so I don't know how much time this is going to take. So I'm not very good at estimating stuff. No, well, especially time. So let, let's see. And okay so let's start inshallah okay so this so we're going to start our sila session off if we get time we're going to go back to our thick of wudu and so on if we get time um hopefully we should get squeeze a bit of time in so i don't plan to take too long on the sila today just want to introduce the topic of sila so just um Okay, so who studied zero before? Okay, inshallah. Anyone from the sisters studied any background on zero? Yeah. So who said you? Hajira. Hajira. Okay, Hajira is here, mashallah. Hajira is your sister here as well? No. Okay. Your sister is Humaira, is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Hajar, you've studied a bit. Is it just when you came to uh, to the madrasa? Yeah. Okay. And any other sisters have background in studying Sira? Sorry, can you say that again? Nafis. Nafis. Okay. Nafis. Uh, where did you study Sira? Or what have you studied? Or is it just. Okay, mashallah. Okay, and anyone from the brothers or online? Sarah New has been studying with us. <coughs> okay, okay, good. So today I'm just going to focus on just why we study Sira, a bit of who the Prophet Sallallahu is, and I'll tell you how we're going to go through the Sira. Okay. So, and, by the, and there's nothing else on this slide, by the way. So I don't have slides for the CEDAW, so I'm going to be doing a bit of discussions. And I, I think, well, I'll share some notes on here, some notes from, but I don't have, I just put this slide up because it looks quite cool, doesn't it? Yeah? But I, don't, I actually don't have anything else. <coughs> yeah, that's my next slide. How do I exit? Okay. Um, Second. Um, where is that document? So it can use a Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to share. Oh, no, not that. Uh, sorry, wrong document. That's just the for fixation. Okay, so I'm going Oh no, I don't know what it's good. There we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. So I'll just, just introduce to uh, the students about the process of why we them. Okay. So why we study the prophet, life of the Prophet is because Allah said in the Quran and Nabi Awla bil Uminina min anfusihim that the believers are closer to uh, sorry, the, the messenger of Allah is closer to the believers than even their own selves. That we as part of our iman to love the Prophet Muhammad. And the Prophet said that La hatta kuna min wa wa that you cannot be a true believer until I become more beloved to him than his father, than his children, entire mankind. So now how do we love someone if we don't know much about them? Yeah, so to love someone, first we need to know who that person was. 
So number one is to increase our love for the Prophet Islam. It's to understand the Quran and Hadith. Sometimes what happens when, when we don't know the Seerah, we quote verses of the Quran out of context because the Quran has a context. The, the Hadiths of the Prophet Islam have a context. If you don't understand that context, you, the version, our version of Islam will be very distorted. So, so sometimes I say many, a human being says many things. But if you have to take every single sentence in isolation and try to understand who I was, then you're going to end up with a very distorted understanding of who I was. Likewise, to understand Islam, you need to understand Sira. So it goes hand in hand. Okay, so today I'm just going to talk about one thing of the Prophet Islam. And we, um, when it comes to Sira, and the reading that I will give students that are able to do the reading. So this is essential reading slash very, very strongly recommended reading. But I'll just call it essential reading just to... Uh, make it short, yeah? So what I'm going to be doing is, uh, the reading that I'll give is going to be from Sirah ibn Hisham. Who knows who ibn Hisham was? Historian. Good, he's a historian. Okay, so we will be going through ibn Hisham and, you know, so not to worry, we're going to, the detail's going to come probably in our next Sirah lesson. So ibn Hisham is a person that, as Muslims, we must know. Every, even if we're not very studied in the religion, but Hish, ibn Hisham, we must know him. And anyone heard of Ibn Ishaq? Shall anyone know anything about him? He did um, Ibn Ishaq. He took from Ibn Hisham. Good. We only have Ibn Ishaq because Ibn Hisham is from him. Lots of things. Okay, good. Yes, correct. Mashallah. You've studied this stuff before? Not, not formally. No. Okay. Mashallah. Who's, who's seen um, Yasir Qadi's Seer on YouTube? That's you. Know, you've seen that? Yeah, generally I recommend a lot of people to watch that. It's, it's, he's, he's very good at presenting things and putting in that. It's, it's a very interesting listen to listen to. I haven't actually listened to a Seer series. Um, I listened to a few. I find it very good. Um, but I've listened to a Sahaba series. I still listen to my way to Blackburn and back. So that's a drive to Blackburn. That's like five hour drive. So I listen to five lectures on the way back, another five lectures. And he's had like 10 lectures per companion, like Abu Bakr. Yeah, yeah. So on my way there and back, I used to cover one companion. <laughs> so, but anyway, okay. So now the, in terms of, so I'm just gonna introduce the Prophet So we're gonna go, the reading will be through Ibn Hisham. And with the, our Sira lessons will not be just from one book. So I'm going to, so all my resources, the stuff that I used to deliver, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put them out in front of you. And so that if anyone wants to go back and check their sources, read it for yourself, read you know a bit of, you know more into it and so on so i'm going to give you guys all the resources um especially the resources that i've used and um, um i'm good basically i'm going to try as much as i can so research is very easy to read you can read a thousand books but it's to like put what's in those thousand books in front of an audience which is very which is very hard so i'm going to be putting um giving you reading this so let's say today i'll talk about a different aspect of the prophet so, so where i got it from i'll give you the references who wants to go back and check them ideally it'd be good for students to go back and check them and read them for yourselves and make notes see what's you know before see what's after read the different chapters in that book and so on and so on it'd be good but anyway but the record the essential 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 reading would be from Hasir ibn Hisham. so i may say okay, read like 10 pages from this chapter. So before I discuss this part of life of the Prophet, at least you've got a summarized version of it from Ibn Hisham, then that'd be very good as a starting point. But if, if someone is not able to do that, don't get scared, it's fine, it's not too much of an issue. But if you can, it's just your first-hand experience with Sira, if you can do at least Ibn Hisham, that'd be good. Okay. Um, I'll explain Ibn Hisham and all this history stuff later. Okay. So, so Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكِ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ so, and by the way, all these documents and my notes and things, I, I can give them out. So you don't need to write anything that's not here. It's just the bad thing about this, what happens is when teachers do that, no students take notes and I don't check the teacher's notes either. <laughs> uh, that, that's one bad thing. But yeah. Yeah, generally I realized even in our class, like no one used to do the reckon, you know, in your classes, do people actually do the recommended readings set by teachers? Uh, so I used to be the guy that five minutes before class, all the students would come up to me and, oh, by the way, what, what are we supposed to read? <laughs> Give me the summary. <laughs> so I'd summarize. I, 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 I do a lot of reading, so I like reading. So all the recommended reading I used to do, you know, and then they provide bibliographies. I used to read everything from bibliographies as well. Uh, I was like one of those thingy guys. <laughs> so then, 
they come up to me like literally five minutes before the class. Oh, by the way, what are we supposed to read? Uh, give us a uh, give us a summary. But uh, apart from the sisters, sisters are generally very good in class. They have like ten different highlighters in front of them with different colors and ten different post-it notes and like Marshall, like set up. Everyone has their own office with all these tools and. But the brothers is like, oh, I don't have a pen with me. I don't have a book with me. Uh, uh, oh, which lesson are we supposed to be in? But yeah. Anyway, so Allah, so the Prophet Allah, is a mercy for the entire mankind. So notice the particular period. He is the mercy for the entire mankind. He he has the greatest example for the human for entire mankind. So the Prophet Allah, is the greatest example for the entire mankind. Um, I'm just gonna get a few of these things. Okay, so what I've done in the next two verses, I'm not going to read, I'm just going to skip a few of these things. So one of the, um, was it, contentions of the people of Makkah and about the Prophet Islam was, why is he a human being? Send us an angel. So then we know that you're definitely from God, where we can speak and see an angel, and then we'll follow you. Now, why is he a human being, flesh and blood like us? Um, and But this is one, this is the main miracle of the Prophet Islam. This is because the purpose of the Prophet is to act as an example, role model for the entire mankind until the day of judgment. So that's why a part of him being a messenger was to be flesh and blood, so he can be a role model. Because if you, an angel's worshiping Allah perfectly, you know, who can say, oh, you know, look at this angel, be like, you know, we're going to say we can't be like this angel. Or if an angel has very good relationships with their husband, with their with the wife, or with their children, or they can do this and that. And then someone tells, be like this angel, be like, can't be like this angel we're humans and he's an angel so so the part of the prophet is so yeah is this the right no you know what this is the wrong document now give me one second you know it's probably not i can't remember I was going to go with that anyway. Okay, anyway. So, uh, by the Zoom, guys, can you see the my screen? Oh, no, you can't. Okay. So, I've taken some extracts out of uh, books as well and some different books, and I've just put it on there just to go through. So, I'm just basically, I'm just putting my notes out there so you guys can see as well on the screen. Okay. So, the Prophet Sam, he gave lessons on morality and manners to his practice. He taught charity by distributing everything that he received among the poor and destitute, love and forgiveness to his enemies as conqueror of Makkah and Hanayn, justice and equity as ruler and judge, peace and security to his enemies as commander of the victorious armies, fairness in dealing by his practice as a trader and love and affection and kindness as a husband and father. All these morals and virtues he practiced and thereby invite the humanity to enrich themselves morally, spiritually, and materially by following in his footsteps. So the Prophet Islam, he came as the best of example. So he, he didn't just teach mere slogans, like do this and that, and he himself lived a very different lifestyle. So the Prophet, whatever he taught, he was the best example on that. He practically demonstrated how to do these things so when he told he commanded us to do charity he practically demonstrated how muslim how generous muslim should be when he commanded us to worship allah he practically demonstrated how muslim should be worshiping allah so in every aspect we have a practical example of how we need to react how we need to act sorry so number one no he was a father he was a husband so and i'm going to go into this regarding other figures in history so he was the father, he was a husband. The Prophet ﷺ was made to go through all the natural journeys that a human being was made to go through. So, and not just that, he didn't have he didn't have the best end of the stick. He had the lowest end of the stick. He was at a disadvantage. How? Let's say, did he ever meet his father? When did he meet his father? Never. Never. Never met his father. How old is he when his mother passed away? Six. Six years old. And then he's looked after by his grandfather, who then passed away at the age of? After two years, yeah. So when he was merely eight years old, so he never met his father. He only spent a few years with his mother because initially he's in the care of Halima. We're going to go through this in a lot of detail, by the way. I'm just, and then, so he has he was at a disadvantage. He was an orphan child, and he grew up as an ordinary boy would grow up. He was what was his first job in Makkah? Yeah, he was a shepherd. So he was look after um, the animals for the people in exchange for just dates or a few coins. And then what was what his main op occupation? He was a? He was a trader, yes, mashallah. <laughs> yeah, but good, yeah, he was a trader. 
So he would start off, we're gonna go, we're gonna have a full lesson on the trading of the proselyzer. Um, so yes, he was a trader by, so he would start off by buying and selling things in Mecca. He'd buy from one shop, sell it to another place, you know, just be a bit more profit. And then he started going out to different Arabian lands. Um, so he made a lot of trade journeys. And then later on, you know, Khadija employed him. Um, why did Khadija employ him? Not just because, yes, he was trustworthy. Generally, when he started the it's just because he was trustworthy and honest. How did the people know he was the most trustworthy? How did the people know he was the most honest? If he's just a random boy that's just, you know, living his own life, how would people know? Let's say in our community, there's so many trustworthy people. Do we know them? No, the reason why he was so known and trustworthy because he, he was a big trader. So that was his job. And when he was to deal with people, he'd be very fair and very trustworthy. And he could be someone that's relied upon. So we're going to go into his business. So he, he was a businessman like any other businessman. He married just like any other uh, person. He had, he had wives, he had children. He, um, so he was, he was a worshiper just like us. And then, you know, he went through different struggles, just like, a, you know, we're going to have one full lesson on the human aspect of the Prophet by the way. It's a very important lesson. Him as a human, who was he? So yes, we see him as a prophet, but as a human being, how was he? Who was he? Um, and his difficulties. So yeah, he, he, he was made to go through all the difficulties. He was made to participate in war. He wasn't a person that sat, sat in the White House and dictated orders and you do this and you do this. He was in the forefront of all the battles. Um, most of his daughters passed away when he was alive. Um, he buried almost all of his children, isn't it? Except apart from one, you know, while he was still alive. So he went through all the difficulties and ups and downs of what a human being would go through. And that's why he is the greatest role model. And he was the perfect and perfect example in, for us in all of these situations and that's why you know we know when a person's actually done some let's say um when a person's gone through that and then they give advice in that situation it's a lot more meaningful than a person who hasn't gone through that gone through that so i can let's say i can tell a homeless person oh by the way be okay but you know if i become homeless myself and then i you know give advice to another homeless it's, it's completely different isn't it so like the quote i mentioned before is the prophet Sam, he went through all of these phases so when the prophet Sam, he he talks about being fair in business he's not a person who has no idea what business is all about then we can't say oh because he's, he's he's given us these rules in business because he doesn't know what business life actually is but he's he was no he used to say trying to earn a lawful livelihood is not vigorous duty in addition to other duties um so he's basically saying to earn a lawful livelihood is a fard upon the believers. So now it's not coming from a random person. This is coming from a businessman who spent his whole life in trade. Now he's telling his companions that you also get involved in trade or, you know, some sort of way of making money. Or, you know, he forbade fraud, interest, gambling, uncertainty, doubt, exploitation, um, and so all these sorts of things because he was a businessman and that's, you know, he understood how all these things worked. So that's why he's very, that's why the problem as a human being is very important to us. I'm going to skip a few things. Okay. But the only difference was between us and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he would, he would be the one that's receiving the guidance, the Quran from Allah. What I mean by guidance is the Quran. Yeah. So he would be, and we, so he'd be the direct recipient of the Quran, but Allah would uh, talk to him um, directly. And the difference is we would, he would then in turn relate that to us. But our guidance is the same. The, the guidance for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the Quran, and the guidance for the general Muslims is what? Is the Quran, isn't it? Yeah. And many things that the Prophet did not receive guidance on, he had to act as a normal human being. And many things that he did receive guidance on through the Quran. But likewise, if it's if that was there as guidance for him, that's the same guidance for us, isn't it? That's the only difference. That's why the Prophet would say to the people, I'm no more than a human being like you, but except that I'm inspired by the Quran. So he's just a normal human being living in Mecca. But there's just one big difference between us and them is that the Quran be revealed upon him. And it's not that the Quran be revealed for everything and anything. As soon as he needed something, Quran, you know, is, you know, snap his fingers, Quran be revealed. Sometimes there'd be no guidance. Sometimes he wouldn't have any help from the Quran. Let's say uh, in the entire Quran, there's no mention of, um, let's say his children passing away. There's, there's not a single mention of it. He was left alone to deal many, with all these issues. Um, there's no mention, let's say, when, who knows when the year of sadness is. In, Yes, Khadija and Abu Talib. Abu Talib. Yeah. 
Yes, in the Quran, there's no mention of the year of sadness. There's no mention of Khadijah's passing away. There's no mention of Abu Talib. This is the Prophet went through extreme, you know, periods of sadness here. But you know, there's no mention of any of these things. There's no mention of his father in the Quran. There's no mention of his mother passing in the Quran. There's no mention of his uncle, you know, his uncles or his grandfathers. There's no mention of Hamza radiallahu and all these different difficult phases that he had to go through. There's no mention of them. The Prophet had to deal with a lot of these challenges by himself as a human being. I don't go too, too much into this today. Um, okay. So now for, okay. So reason, the purpose for this, the reason why I've chosen to discuss this as a first lecture, just so we understand and appreciate what we have. Yeah. So this is, this is the main reason to appreciate the example and role model of the Prophet Sallallahu that we have. Okay. So for a person, so any questions so far? No, I think I've been speaking way too fast. I'm going to slow it down. Yeah, just slow it down. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So for a person to be a complete role model, at least three things are necessary. Number one, what we know about them has to be true and factual. Because if it's just made up myths and things, we can't really follow that person, be like that person. So how do we know it's true in the first place? Yeah, so number one, the information that we have about them needs to be true and factual. Number two, in the, the, the stuff that's related to, about them must be meaningful, must be purposeful, must be practical, yeah? So if it's just gibberish and or just, you know, random slogans that don't really make sense, then obviously you can't even follow them. Like, so it has to be meaningful, has to be purposeful, has to be practical. I'm gonna come, I'm gonna touch on all these, yeah? And it must not be difficult to understand like jigsaw puzzle beliefs. Who do you think I was referred to in this? Yeah, because Christians, like, you know, there's so many differences in what they who their God is, whether it's three, whether it's one, whether, you know, who's, you know, who's, what's the status of this? Imagine, like, not knowing even who your God is. Uh, so it's like their beliefs are like, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's very, um, yeah, it's not really practical for everyone to follow. Okay. So in order to serve as examples and ideals, their lifestyles and life stories would have to be historically proven, real and concrete not just mere names and mere facts that they were born, lived, preached, high ideals, and then died, is not sufficient as guidance. Okay, let's look at some ancient religions before Islam, yeah? So let's take Hinduism. So in Hinduism, heroes seem to be uh, living in a basic fancy world, and, if and by the way, there's gonna be a lot of grammar mistakes and punctuation and spelling, it's just my random typing of most of it, yeah? Um, okay, so we have Hinduism. So the, the, the people that they follow, there's no, like historian can't sit down and look at you know the history behind it and say you know these are facts. It's, it's just all myths and stories passed down. Yeah. So there's no concrete anything concrete to go by. There's no historical facts generally, and the the gods and people that they follow they're more of like imaginary people or creatures. What you know what they whatever they are rather than actual historical people that you know this ex he existed in that period of time and it's what they did. They're more like just imaginary myths. So that's why they're not really, they can't really serve as guides, guides for the rest of humanity because what we know about them can't even be, uh, you know, can't even be proven. Okay, and then we have, let's say, um, the Zoroastrian religion, which is again, another predates Islam by thousands of years. Yeah, so what do we know about the Zoroastrian religion? So in, uh, it was started by Zoroaster. So it collected certain life events which are conflicting and contradictory and cannot serve as guidance. We have a very sketchy and unreliable information about his life is available and it cannot test, stand the test of historically recorded events. So basically, again, so historians, they can't really prove what happened. So Zoroaster, so let's see what we know about him. Zoroaster, who founded the Zoroastrian religion, is another historical figure. His life story is, again, sketchy and all of it is based on speculation and not on historical records. It is not possible with certainty to determine when he lived and legislated. No historical account is given by his followers of the life and teaching of their prophet. What we know is that he was born in Azerbaijan and preached there on Balkh. The king, Hash, what's it called? Hashdasa, accepted his faith. He performed extraordinary miracles. He married, had children, and died. So this is basically what we know about the founder of their religion. So can he be a role model and guide for you know, all of his followers or mankind to their children? Perhaps not. Let's look at Buddhism, again, another historical religion. What do you know about that? So lifestyle of Buddha is not preserved and we have no historical evidence. No historical evidence, yeah? So it fails category number one. Okay, so let's see. First of all, there is Buddha, but his life, again, so it's a mixture of myths and stories. And what do we know about him? Is that he was a son of a Raja who lived in the Valley of Nepal. He was married to a beautiful princess and had a son. 
he was given to meditation and thinking. Once he happened to see some miserable incidents of sickness, so basically he was he, he was very enclosed, isn't it? So he wasn't really exposed to the outside world. And one day, you know, he was allowed to go out and saw people being sick, people, people things, people uh, going wrong with people, and so on and so on. And which kind of moved him. So like, you know, what's he started? Then that initiated like a quest, theological quest in him. So he wandered around and went from place to place. After some years of meditation, he claimed to have received the divine revelation. He preached his face in places between wherever that is, and then he died. Okay. So now what did Buddha do? So we see Buddha secretly leaving his family, slipping into the forest. MashaAllah. He left everything and severed his relationship with the people. He never lived in a society and faces complex problems. His code of life can hardly be accepted as a comprehensive final complete guide for all men and women. It has never been accepted as a guide for the solution or the solution of practical problems of life. He's basically more suited to the requirements of a hermit leading a lonely life in the monastery of a uh, hermit or hermitage. Yeah, so we don't really know much about him. Yeah, so we don't know much about him. Um, his lifestyle can hardly be called a role model for his followers. Yeah. Okay, then another historic um, religion is Jainism. Again, we don't really know anything about him, just myths and where was that? Okay, let's go to Semitic prophets. So let's say the Jews, they follow Moses from their scriptures, they follow, um, the Christians have followed Jesus. So can they act as role models for us today? So let's say those for those that are following their religions. So Semitic prophets, of whom Noah, Ibrahim, Hud, Salih, Ishaq, Yaakov, Zechariah. Okay, so generally the previous prophets that came in history, we don't really know much about them. Yeah, even from the Quran, even from the Bible, even from the Old Testament or the, any of the scriptures. We don't know much about that, yeah? But let's take two prophets in, in particular. So, in, so generally regarding other prophets, we only have fragments of their lives. And who, when, whoever we do know some stuff about, just fragments of you know, random stuff. Okay. Okay, so now regarding the Old Testament. So again, so from a historic, historic perspective, there's a lot of contradictions. There's a lot of within academic circles when was it written was it written hundreds or thousands of years after hundreds of years after you know Musa al islam or you know and so on and you know so it's very so in terms of um, academic research that has been done from a history perspective it's very difficult to say what's factual what's not and to trace it back to it's to say this is absolutely correct this is not there's a lot of discussion around this and the original bible generally people don't have the original bible in the original language and when you don't have the original language, it's an interpretation of what you think was in the original, isn't it? And even in, you know, today, when general Christians have the Bible, what is it? It's just in English. They don't even have, the, um, you know, so everyone goes by that. So this, again, from it, first it was in what? It was in Aramaic, then to Greek. Uh, yeah, and then from these languages it was translated into English. So like it wasn't even translating English from the original source. It's a transition of a transition of a transition, isn't it? Yeah, they don't have the original Hebrew or Aramaic. Yeah. So, and again, so let's say John, who was John, one of the authors of the, so there's, you know, there's a lot of debate around who these even, who even wrote them and when they were born, you know, and so on and so on. Okay, so let's look at um, Moses from their scriptures, yeah? Okay, so Moses, the prophet Moses is the most eminent of the Semitic prophets but even his life is not fully known. What we know about him is that he was fostered and nourished in the royal palace of Pharaoh after his birth in the Jewish family. When he grew up, he disliked the oppression of the Israelites by the people of Pharaoh. He helped his fellow beings whenever he could. Then he went to Madian and he married. He lived there for a number of years and was made a prophet to return to Egypt. And he performed many mir miracles before Pharaoh and who wouldn't let his people go with him. So then he escaped um, and then the sea part and then the Pharaoh's forces were drowned and so on. So that's basically what we know about him. And this is from the Old Testament. Generally, this is how much knowledge that we have. So internal evidence shows that the Bible of Moses contained in the Old Testament was not written by Moses, but by someone else much later. And, but in terms of Moses, what do you know about him as a father? Nothing. What do you know about him as a son? Nothing. What about his other relationships? Nothing. What about him as a businessman or how he lived his day-to-day -day life? Nothing. His, the fact that he's a brother, friend, husband. We don't have anything else practical information about him. Yes, we have some prophetic things that he did this, he did this, and this. But is that enough to be a you know, role model for the you know, later generations to come? Okay, so that's that. So we don't really have much in terms of him as a person. But in terms of, let's say, Jesus or Isa alayhi salam, again, one of the great prophets of Islam. 
So according to the Bible, he lived for only 33 years on earth, of which he records only the account of his last three years of life. Even the fact described in the Bible and the historical authentic. So, you know, if you to just uh, analyze it historically, that's a different debate altogether. But let's just say, assuming everything there is true, we are told that he was born in Palestine, then brought to Egypt, he performed two miracles in his teens. Then, after a gap, we see him as literally just 30 years old, baptized. He preached to fishermen on the banks of rivers and had some disciples. There were some discussions and disputes between him and the Jews. And then he was handed over to the Romans who tried to crucify him. So basically during the 25 years of his life, all we know is that he performed a few miracles and that's really it really. And another thing is, let's say in the Bible, from the Bible, I understand that God loved his son. Yeah, so he had immense love for his son and he was ready to even sacrifice his son. How much love did the son have for God? What was his worship? What was his night prayers like? What was his you know, worship routine during the day? How did he show his love for his father? Like, there's not really much information. That's what we need to be as followers, isn't it? We need to know how Jesus worshipped the Father. Uh, so we know how to replicate that. But there's literally hardly anything in one or two passages about you know, him falling down and bowing down. That's literally it. So we don't really have much guidance on that. So there is no guidance in Jesus' life, as revealed in the Bible, which can help human beings to establish a relationship with God. So yes, there are like slogans, there's... Um, principles there, but in terms of practical guide and demonstration of these principles, there's nothing there. Um, so the Bible does not reveal anything from him regarding human relationships, the maintenance of which is the key to, uh, to, key to the success of a human society. So yes, religion establishes your connection with God, but we need religion to have a good functioning society as well, isn't it? And there's nothing like that in the Bible as an example. The whole structure of human society rests on fair mutual dealings and so on and so on. And he lived the life of a bachelor and therefore can hardly be presented as an ideal for solving marital problems. His life therefore cannot offer a perfect and complete guide. So he cannot be a complete guide for the entire humanity for until the day of judgment. And by the way, just, just in case someone's confused, just Isa is one of the greatest prophets of Islam, by the way. I'm just taking this from the Bible perspective, yeah? And Clinton Bennett, another Orientalist, is a Christian. Um, he says that after de deducting miracles from Jesus' life, we actually don't know much about him. And then he, he brings Islam into the, apart from, as opposed to Muhammad, where we know literally everything there is to know about it. Uh, but yeah, so, okay, let's look at the Prophet Muhammad so. so a person whose complete lifestyle and life example is preserved, who lived fully in the hustle and bustle of life, and whose life in full detail is clear and open, can really be considered as a perfect model and ideal for guiding the lives of people. So every detail of his life is recorded and authentic, noble and perfect, simple and clear, practical and appealing. This lifestyle can guide every man and woman, king or beggar, military commander or soldier, husband or father, trader or farmer in every area of their life and lead them to a happy and peaceful life. So one of the greatest things about the Prophet Islam is his comprehensiveness. And this is why Allah intentionally made him go through all the difficulties that a normal human being would generally have to go through. Because why did Allah do that? The Prophet Muhammad is the most beloved person to Allah. Someone that you love, you want them to go through ease, isn't it? But Allah made him go through the most difficulty to act as a role model and guide for us as later generations. So he could practically demonstrate how to do all of these things. So number one, that's why one of the greatest things about him is his life is comprehensive. So we need to appreciate that as Muslims, to appreciate that, as opposed to, let's say, the Christian following Jesus or Moses and so on and so on. Okay. Number two is preachings were practical. They weren't just mere slogans. Every, one thing, good, one thing uh, we need to you know, thank of Allah for is that all of our teachings and everything inside the Quran Hadith is extra, it's, the most practical thing that a person can do at a time. So let's look at some part of the passage of the Bible. So Jesus, according to the Bible, Jesus said, but I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whoever shall smite you on your right cheek, turn him the other also. So this is a command in the Bible. Imagine someone slaps you and like, oh, okay, yeah. It's not very practical. Like, <laughs> how many of us are able to do this sort of stuff? So not, you know, it's not very practical advice. Or you know, another passage of the Bible. And if any man will sue you at the law, and take away, basically, if anyone steals your coat, let him have your cloak as well. <laughs> and if I come to you and steal your possession, oh, okay, here's my phone as well. Like, so how practical is that? You know, as, you know, that's not how humans work. Like in, in Islam, the Prophet said, man putila duna, man, man putila, look at, let's look at the, you know, in Islam, the Prophet said, man putila duna malihi fahuwa shaheed. 
whoever dies protecting his wealth is a martyr because it's in nature of a person. Someone tries to come into my house and steal something from me. I'm not going to say, you know what, here's my PC as well. I'm going to protect my wealth because it's valuable to me. And the Prophet said, to such an extent, if you're killed protecting your wealth, you die as the death of a martyr. Because no, Islam appeals to the natural fit of a human being. It's not just empty words and slogans and impractical advice for you know these scenarios. Okay, and so like, like I said, so the Prophet has, has made to go through all the different stages. So that how can you set an example of magnanimity or forgiving enemies without defeating or capturing your enemy? So the Prophet, he went through warfare, he captured his enemy, he showed his forgiveness, conqueror of Mecca. Imagine returning, marching back to Mecca as a conqueror. And then forgiving all the people that tortured you. Now, what great example of forgiveness can we find in human history? How can you help the poor? How can you help the poor or the destitute if you're penniless and living lonely in the forest and you know jungles? The Prophet he had much wealth coming in and he showed us how to be generous to the poor. Um, how can anyone advise on marital relationships and matrimonial problems who has not married himself or faced such problems? That's why the Prophet had many wives to, to give so many different perspectives. How can anyone devise rules and principles for the trader, business judge, ruler, and commander without experiencing the situations? So what is necessary is that the needy are helped, the hungry are fed, the oppressed and the weak are rescued, the sick and invalid are visited, and so on, practically, um, and demonstrated how this is done. So this is why the Prophet he fulfills all of these uh, models. In terms, of, in terms of historically proven, what, what's the, what feature is unique with Islam? When it comes to historically proving things, this is a question, by the way. It's not. Good. Who who knows what the what the snad system is? It's not, or in other words, sanad. Um, is that the list of all the names? Um, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like the list of all the names where you get the information. Good. Good. Yeah. Authentication. Yeah, so it's a method of authentication which is unique to Islam. There's no other system in the world that has this. So in terms of, in terms of um, let's say, being historically proven, so all of everything attributed to the Prophet Islam, is it start with Quran and then everything else, you know, to do with Islam. We will, everything comes with the Isnad, which is called the Sanad or the uh, the chain of narration. Yeah. Uh, how did it actually start? Um, was it an organic thing or was it? somebody like instituted that we need to document this. Okay, it was completely organic, which is one of the beauty of Islam. Like there's no like system that someone imposed. This is literally just organic. The Sahaba, they had the zeal of wanting to know what's authentic, what's not authentic. So naturally, when, I, when you want to follow, when you have the overwhelming desire to follow that which is absolutely factual, naturally you're gonna, where did you get it from? So then that turned into, you know what, where did you get it from? Okay, I'll go from him, where, where did he get it from? So this is what, this is what the Isnad system is. So let's say I narrate, to, let's, or let's say nowadays, you know, now it's all in books, but let's say Imam Bukhari, rahimullah. We've, uh, most of us heard of Bukhari, famous hadith. Um, so he collected, um, let's say he had, he memorized 600,000 hadiths, 600,000, yeah, with the chain of narration, yeah. And so basically, so how chain of narration works, just for those that are new to it, let's say I narrate to you um, something from the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu so I say the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said XYZ. Now the question is, how do you know I said that? Where did I get this hadith from? Yeah. So now I would tell you a chain of narration. I got it from Zaid, who got it from Omar, who got it from Hasib, who got it from um, Uthman, who heard the Prophet say this. Does that make sense? So every hadith for it to be relied upon or for, for it to be accepted, it needs to come with a chain of narration. If a hadith does not have a chain of narration, this is not a hadith, this is rejected. Everyone understood that so far? Okay, now the question is, um, and now, and now this, then this comes in the study of hadith, uh, hadith chains and so on and so on. Now we need to know who these people were in the chain narration. What if he was a liar, he was a liar, he was a liar. And so everyone just fabricated. So now it came of the science of biographies where anyone that's ever narrated a hadith, the biography has been written down. And so, that's, um, so this, is, this is a very, very big science in Islam where, bio, where you study biographies of people. So you say, okay, did this person ever lie? If you've lied before, your hadiths are generally rejected. Um, if you, even if it's a white lie, even if it's, or let's say your knowledge was very good, but in the later years, you, when you became an old man, your knowledge became weak, that would be written down. So take his hadith when he was young, when you reach the age of 50, don't take any hadith from him. All these, everything will be written down, everything. It's like Imam Tirmidhi, rahimullah. He was, 
Um, Imam Tirmidhi, he was one of the great muhadithi, hadith scholars, where he would memorize hadiths and write hadiths down. And near the, at the end of his life, he became blind. He, he became blind. So what happened was he was traveling and his students were with him as well. Just an example, just so you understand what hadith scholarship meant to, to those hadith scholars. So he became blind. And as he was traveling on his animal, he ducked. He can't see anything. So he ducked. And then after he lifted up his head and he started carrying forward. And then his students asked him, like, why did you randomly duck all of a sudden? Like, lower your head, meaning. Why did you lower your head? You're like, it's like you're dodging, avoiding something. And said, yes, there's a branch here. Um, I remember passing by here a while ago when I could see, and there was a branch here. So that's why I ducked. Said, no, there's no branch here. What are you talking about? So the students, this is the first time they're traveling here. So no, there's no branch here. Imam Tirmidhi thought, okay, you know what, let's stop. Because is my memory become weak? Or has the branch and the whatever was here, forest or whatever, been cut down? He was worried. Why was he worried? Because if he's made a mistake in his memory, then it puts a doubt to all of his hadiths that's narrated. So they said, okay, let's find the people that live in this area. They found that and they questioned and said, yes, there used to be loads of branches and trees and all these things here. So they said, Alhamdulillah, I don't need to dispose of my hadiths. Mm -hmm. So this is how like, particular they were. If someone had ever lied, he's, he's big class as a liar, won't accept hadiths from him. So it's very, they were scrutinized. So, not, and let's say, did, um, not just that, so even let's say, did they have a student teacher relationship? Let's say if you're narrating from, uh, in your generation, has he been narrating from Omar, for example? Did they meet each other? Was it possible for them to meet each other? Did they live in the same, you know, where did they, or, you know, were the time periods different? So everything is basically scrutinized to, you know, the minutest detail. So this is what you call the Isnad system. So that's why everything that we have from the Prophet Islam, what we know is authentic. And, and the, the scholars in Islam, and because from the Prophet Islam, he said, whoever attributes a lie towards me, in, um, then let him prepare for, um, for the hellfire. So we have very stern warnings not to attribute any false information to the Prophet Islam. And that's why the Sahaba, whenever they had side doubt, they would they say this is weak. This is weak. So it's not that we're trying to include anything that's praising the Prophet, which is going to include it within our... Um, you know, our documents, whatever. So they're very particular, separating that which is weak or doubtful from that which is authentic. So in terms of authenticity, no other system in the world can compare to us. There's no other system. Now, in terms of comprehensiveness, there's no other figure in human history that is as comprehensively known as the Prophet So let's read a few of these things. So I've, I've been taking quotes from non-Muslims because obviously Muslims are biased. Yeah, obviously we're going to say it's perfect, everything. Let's look at non-Muslims. So Dr. Sprenger, German, German Orientalist, in a preface to some German book in English, published in 1853 to 1854, so a very long time ago, in Calcutta writes, there's no nation, nor has there been any, which like them has during 12 centuries recorded the life of every man of letters. If the biogra biographical records of the Muslims, he calls them, uh, that's what they used to call them in the thing, and it's called Muhammadans. Yeah. Isn't that Muhammadans? Yeah. What was his name? Carl. I was reading his transcript of his talk. One of the earliest, the, one of the first speeches done on Islam. Carl Earl, Carl something. I was reading his transcript. So he's calling them Muhammadans, and he's saying like all sorts of about us, by the way. Yeah. It wasn't very pleasant. But yeah, we were known as the Muslims or Muhammadans generally. So if the bio biographical records of the Muslims, how you pronounce it? were collected, we would probably have accounts of the lives of half a million distinguished persons. Even non-Muslims attested to that, our Isnad basically. John Devonport, in his book entitled Apology for Muhammad and the Quran writes, of all lawmakers, and we're gonna finish in about five minutes, of all lawmakers and con uh, conquerors, there's none the events of whose life are more true and detailed than that of the Prophet Muhammad. Reverend. So again, a Christian, Reverend Bosworth Smith, in his lectures on Muhammad Muhammadanism, which he delivered, delivered at the Royal Institution of Great Britain, said, but in Muhammadanism, everything is different. Here, instead of being shadowy and mysterious, we have history. We know as much of Muhammad as we do even of Luther and Milton. The mythical, the legendary, the supernatural is almost wanting in the original Arab authorities, or at all events, can easily be distinguished from what is historical. So historically, every word and every act of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has been recorded and a full record of his utterances, actions, achievements, dealings with his wife and other people, his letters and instructions to kings and chiefs, tribes, and collectives. Uh, basically everything's recorded. Um, some you know, his words and practices, his whole life, 
his family with his wives and children, his prayers, conduct at home with his followers, his business transactions, even his business partners are known, by the way, you know, he's done built business with everything. Uh, his preaching, um, his wars, people that are opposed to him, uh, his, physical um, his physical description. Anyone know what the genre is called when the physical de description of the Prophet Islam? What do we call this genre in Islam? Anyone from sisters? Physical description, which subject deals with that? Called the Shamail. Shamail. Anyone heard of a Shamail book? What's the name of a Shamail book? The most famous one is Shamail al Tirmidhi. So the Hadith author at Tirmidhi, he compiled it. Okay, so in the Shamail, literally, we know everything about it, every description in terms of how his eyebrows were how long his nose was, how wide his mouth was, how curly or straight his hair was, how hairy his arms were. How, um, we know that um, how hairy his legs were. They weren't hairy. That's, that was the point of the Sahaba describing him. He, he wasn't a hairy man. How one thin line of hair ran down from his top chest to his, uh, to his navel. They describe him as a person. His, his, they say that his joints were very large. His shoulders were very broad. When he used to walk, uh, when he used to walk, it's as if he's you know, descending from a higher place to a lower place. So literally, we know every single detail that there is to know about a human being, you know, recorded with full authenticity. Now compare that to, let's say, Jesus or other religions. So imagine the rich heritage of Islam, you know, that we have in front of us with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And look at look what the non-Muslims are testing to. So as Gibbon says, Gibbon, non-Muslim. So we're gonna finish in four minutes, inshallah. So no prophet tested his disciples in such fiery ordeals as Muhammad, all the wars that you have to go through, isn't it? Imagine making your followers go through and putting, you know, sacrificing their children and everything that they are. As, the, as Muhammad the prophet did, he preached the divine mission and declared himself a prophet to those who knew him as a man, to his wife, servant, and intimate friends. They're the ones that initially accepted some as his close family members. Why was it his close family members that are accepting some not random fishermen or, you know, at the, at the banks? Because they knew him as a human being the most. That's why for us to love him, we need to know him as a human being. And this is why, this is why I started with this. Godfrey Higgins writes in his book, Apology for Muhammad, that the Christians would do well. This is, this is very interesting. That's why I posted it here. The Christians would do well to recollect that the doctrine of Muhammad created a degree of enthusiasm in his followers, which is to be sought in vain in the immediate followers of Jesus. This is a Christian writing this. Um, when Jesus was led to the cross, his followers left him to perish. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other hand, it says, and then skips a bit, and it goes on. It says, the followers of Muhammad, on the contrary, rallied around the persecuted prophet and risking their lives in his defense, made his triumph over all his enemies. And so when we get to the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, we'll see that one of the, one of the people, the Quraysh was sending delegates isn't it, to write the treaty. And one of them, uh, while one of the Quraysh was talking to the Prophet Islam, he was stroking the Prophet's beard. And one companion, he got very angry. He took out his sword and hit uh, with the handle end, hit him and he realized that's his own nephew because he was covered in uh, armor. He didn't know who he was at the time. And then he said, you know, and then he said to the Prophet Muhammad that, you know, all your companions, they're going to leave you. They don't, they don't want, they're not going to have anything to do with you. And the Sahaba obviously responded and everything. And then when he went back to the Quraysh and what he said was, I have never seen a group of followers so dedicated to their leader, like, you know, like the Sahaba said, you know, in terms of how they would defend him, that even when he would do wudu, they would rush to gather the water falling off his limbs. And when he would spit, they would literally fight to take that spit and rub it on, on themselves. And he says, I swear by Allah that he is not anything like the leaders of the Persians or the Romans. This man is something different. So even the non-Muslims at his time attested to that. And last quote, I think. So the author, he writes, they must have seen him, observed him, and tested him from every angle, and then found him absolutely perfect in every way. Otherwise, they would not have so readily sacrificed their lives of their own accord for him. In fact, his life was a complete guidance for them in every walk of life. That is why it produced a revolutionary effect on the nation which had, ever, which had never been <coughs> united, which is the Arabs, in its entire history before Islam and thereafter became a dominant force in world politics. So basically, because of who he was as a human being, as a man, this is why he changed the world. Like literally, he changed the world and he mobilized, you know, such a great empire and, you know, everything that happened because of who he was as a man. Now, despite all this authentic information, not myths, not legends, we know not just, we don't have just scarce information about him. Despite having so much detailed knowledge, if we don't know anything about him as Muslims, being born Muslims, 
that how sad is that? How sad is that? Christians, they got an excuse. They don't know anything about Jesus. There's nothing in the Bible. They don't know much about Torah, but we have everything at our disposal. That's why we have to make sure we know everything about this person. And so that will, inshallah, create the love. So inshallah, from next lesson in the seerah, we're going to look at the authenticity. How do we know what we know from the seerah is authentic, which is a very, very big thing. So inshallah, we'll look at that next week, inshallah. Today, we don't have time to go into our wudu. Hopefully, to, um, by next week, inshallah, I should be a bit more organized with the time allocation, inshallah. Are you doing my Saturday off? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so there's no lesson next Saturday. Next Saturday is off. I'm going to put the timetable. Everything is on the Telegram group, yeah? Um, so I'm going to put the timetable and the calendar on the Telegram group as well today. Um, so you can Where just go. The link the um, it should be sent to you um, on WhatsApp. So I sent it last week. But if you still uh, just double check, and if you don't have it or for whatever reason, just message me and I'll send, I'll send it. Inshallah. So from next week, I'm going to take a register, yeah? So next week is like our official start of the course. This was just some, you know. Oh, sorry, the, the week after next, week after next, week after next. Oh, random slow. Uh, yes, I can come after Salah, Okay, we got the... Okay, so in terms of the... And then guys, I'll see you next uh, week off next, inshallah.